Let's go and get started. A um, couple things. Uh, let me get the sign-in sheet passed around, or I am going to forget it. Okay, um, I went ahead and laid out some handouts up here for those of you that are in concrete design. If you're not in concrete design and you grab these, like put them back. <laughs> um, these, are, these are just for the concrete folks. Um, let's talk about steel though. So you have a homework due today. So there's a pile over here on this side of the room that we are, uh, that, that I'm currently collecting uh, work for. Here you go. Um, homework five is going to be assigned on Friday. So um, you give a, a little bit of a respite. And I'll tell you, homework five is going to be pretty short. Uh, welded connections you're going to find is not very difficult. It, it is what it is. Um, so I'm going to assign that on Friday. It's really probably only going to have two problems on it. Um, and it's going to be due, for, I think, the following week. Uh, and then I think about all the homework that we have that's due before spring break. So um, you're... Your second exam, though, will be before spring break, and it will be on bolted connections, homework four, and welded connections, homework five. So that'll be exam two. Um, yes? What? Uh, it's, we're, remember, we're going to uh, review on Monday, exam on Wednesday, and then that Friday we're canceling class. Yeah, is, is that... I, I just, okay, that yeah, sounds right. So the exam's on the 15th. Sound good? So, in fact, why don't I go ahead and pull the schedule up on the syllabus just so everybody's clear. Um, if the computer would decide to cooperate. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so we are right uh, here. So it's the 19th. We're doing welded connections. We're a l it seems like we're a little behind, but we're actually going to probably make up some steam today on welded connections today. Um, uh, we will assign homework five on Friday, and we'll probably be beginning columns on Friday, get into uh, columns between now and spring break. Monday we have our exam review, Wednesday we have the exam, and then Friday before spring break uh, is a makeup day. Assuming we don't have a blizzard between now and then, we'll go ahead and cancel class. Sound good? All right. What's that? The makeup day, yes. No problem. All right. Then let's get into welds. Um, I do want to sort of make up some ground today. Um, so, what? Oh, well, thank you. Well, thank you. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> no, no, I'm good. Oh, God. This is showing up on the recording. There. <laughs> I'll think about it. <laughs> there is something to that. All right. Um, <laughs> for my birthday, we'll talk about Philip Wells. How's that? Okay. Um, so last time, if you recall, we talked about weld metal capacity and base metal capacity. And if you recall, weld metal capacity is a function really of the effective throat, the dimensions of the weld, uh, and your electrode strength. Beyond that, it's very plug and chug. Base metal capacity is very similar. Um, just a function of your uh, uh, your steel grade and your gross and net area. I mean, it, it's pretty simple. Um, we were in a little bit of a hurry on the weld limitations, so I thought I would just sort of briefly go over those again. Just like with bolted connections, there are limits associated with welded connections. Now, we have, uh, for, for welded connections, we have minimum and maximum weld sizes, and they are for very specific reasons. Now, minimum weld sizes 
if you recall, the reason for that is the heat sink effect. I mean, if you've got, and, and I know the example was a little out there, but if you've got uh, something like an eight inch thick plate and you're trying to place a bead of weld that's only a quarter of an inch uh, uh, in size, well, that super thick plate is going to act like a heat sink and you're not going to get um, uh, the weld penetration that you need to fully develop that joint. So you're going to get a very brittle joint and you're, uh, and you're not going to get uh, an effective weld. So based on the material thickness of the thinner part, so if you have a, a half inch plate and a three eighths inch thick plate and you're welding those together, you go off of the three eighths since the you know, heat sink effect, you're trying to be conservative going off of the minimum thickness. Based on where you're at, you can determine a, a minimum size of your, uh, of your fillet weld. Okay. So that's pretty straightforward. That's the one that you look up. Okay. Now for maximum, uh, and, and again, this goes into uh, rapid cooling, just as Charles mentioned earlier. Now that's minimum sizes. Maximum size of a weld is either the thickness of the plate or the thickness of the plate minus a sixteenth of an inch, dependent upon how thick your plate is. If your plate is less than a quarter of an inch thick, we just say, what the heck, let's just let the weld equal the plate thickness. If not, uh, thickness minus a uh, sixteenth. And the reason why is really because of this right here on the right. Um, our thought is, you know, if you're, if you're placing a fillet weld, we'd like to maintain the geometry of the plate. So we sort of back off the maximum weld size uh, about a sixteenth of an inch. Because if that weld gets too big, what's going to happen is you're going to start to melt this part of the plate right here. And then you're not going to have a really well-defined edge for, for placing your weld. Now that's for pretty typical plates. For, for really thin ones, stuff that's like a quarter of an inch, we say, what the hell, go ahead and melt it. it, it it's small enough anyways, it's not really going to matter. Okay. Sound good? So, you know, let, let's, just so everybody's clear, we have minimum and maximum weld limits. The minimum limits are for rapid cooling and for that heat sink effect. We need a, a stout enough weld to penetrate through the plate and actually develop a proper joint. The maximum weld size limit is intended to uh, uh, maintain the geometry of the plate. Right. Sound good? Um, there are also limits on weld length. Um, for instance, the minimum length of a weld that, that uh, you can count on for structural capacity is 4A, where A is how big the weld is. So if you have a that weld has to be at least two inches long for you to count it for structural capacity. I'll be honest, I, uh, we really don't run into that. That's usually not a, a big issue from a, a design standpoint. Um, and in most building connections, we don't even get, get close to this stuff. If the weld gets too long, we apply a reduction factor for its capacity, but too long, I mean, you're talking about really, really long welds. Most of the uh, welds that we look at are, are well within these, uh, these two limits, and it's really not a, uh, uh, a big concern. So far, so good? Yes? A, you said A, A, okay, that's a good question. A is, uh, instead of drawing it, a is this. A is the, uh, the, the, when we say the size of the weld, I'm referring to the, the leg of that triangle. The throat is 0.707 times that. It's a good question. Sound good? All right. The only other thing that I think is, is really worth mentioning is not really anything that you're going to find in the spec. Well, well, first off, let me, let me uh, put this. So I have a, uh, a summary of slides. Uh, it starts on 246. It goes from 246 to 247. Those are just a summary of all of the weld equations. That's definitely something you want to put a big star in, uh, in your notes because literally it's all right there. We have the weld metal capacity and the two equations for base metal capacity, either shear yielding or shear fracture. And then we've got weld limits, minimum weld sizes and maximum weld sizes. <coughs> right. so if you haven't already put a big star on that, you definitely have to. Sound good? Okay. This one right here uh, is not something you're going to find in the code, but it's definitely something you're going to want to keep in the back of your head. Um, by and large, a very, very common weld size that we use for design when possible is 5 sixteenths. And where the heck are you coming from 5 sixteenths? Okay. 5 sixteenths is about the largest weld uh, size that we can deposit with a single pass. Okay, so let's 
you know, to explain that, let's say we've got a, something like a, a three-quarter inch weld, like some really, really big weld that we've got to deposit. Maybe it's the column base plate on a 50-story or something, you know, the, a nuts weld. Well, in order to deposit that weld, you have to make multiple passes of your electrode. So you might have something like this. Um, let's see, you got this. You got this, you got this. Okay, let's say you're trying to make this connection. Let's say you need you know, something like three quarters. So you're going to make a pass. So, so let's be clear, you know, the plate goes in and out of the screen like this. So you're going to pass the electrode along this joint. You might place uh, a little bit of weld material, and it might look something about something like that. Okay. Well, in order to get that really large weld size, you've got to make multiple passes. So you're sort of taking that weld and you're building up on it. So you might have another pass that sort of does that. And then you might have another pass that does this and so on and so forth. And you're sort of building up on it. So you might have one that sort of, you know, does that. And you might have another one like this. And then you have another one, you know, like that. Everybody see the kind of idea? You've got to make multiple passes to get those, those really, really large weld deposits. Now, in a single pass, just about the largest weld size you can get is 5 sixteenths of an inch, okay? And more often than not, if I had the choice between using uh, a 5 sixteenths, uh, let's put it like, if I had a choice between a 5 sixteenths inch weld or a 3 sixteenths inch weld, I'm going to go with the 5 sixteenths any day of the week because a larger weld size is going to result in a shorter weld length, okay? And typically, a shorter weld length is quicker to deposit, okay? So faster uh, weld means less labor, less time, less money, okay? All right. Ultimately, as long as you're getting the same effective area of the weld, bless you, as long as you're getting the same, you know what, effective throat multiplied by the effective length, as long as the area is the same, I mean, you could have a short 5 16 inch weld and a long 3 16 inch weld, and they both have the same capacity. But from a fabrication standpoint, what's going to be quicker and easier to deposit? The larger weld size, shorter weld length. Does that make sense? Okay. So would a, uh, a shorter weld length also um, reduce the possibility for defects in the weld? Like the longer a weld you have, the more... That's a good point. And, and I'd say, I don't want to say yes, but most likely. Um, you know, I mean, when you weld, you are introducing a flaw. Like, that's, that's what you're doing. And uh, there's the potential for micro crack to develop, um, you know, potential for loss in ductility. I mean, that's what you do when, when you weld. So any time that you weld, especially high-capacity structural welds, they, you know, along with that comes a high degree of QAQC, high degree of weld inspection. Um, so, yeah, I mean, just from that standpoint, fewer welds, means less inspection, less QAQC. So, um, so you're right. Uh, that, um, but I don't want to say that the answer is always yes. It's most likely, I'd say. <laughs> That's a good question. Any, anything else? This is good stuff. Yes, sir. What do you mean? Are you talking about this? I, I think you're looking at it a, a little bit in, in a little bit of an incorrect fashion. What I'm getting at with this is that, you know, this particular connection, this particular example I'm talking about, I'm talking about a like a column on a on a 50-story building. You've got to have a weld that big. You, you, you see what I mean? There's really no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Um, so there's no real trade-off. What's up? Oh, we're supposed to get hit with some serious rain, which, which, which I have to I have to actually end concrete a little early because I have a meeting at 11 o'clock in Corbley. So <laughs> yeah, I bought an umbrella this morning. Just I'm gonna I'll just Mary Poppins across. The <laughs> Oh, goodness. All right. So um, any other questions before we get in? Did that sort of answer your question? There, there, 
we're, we're talking about there's really no way to get around that on a weld like this. I mean, you, you, you just have to sit there and keep passing and passing until you reach your appropriate size. I'm saying when you have the option. Uh, it, it depends. Um, there is no, look, there is no um, simple yes or no answer. Um, let me put it like this. So let's say you are um, doing a beam-to-beam -beam connection in a building. So a typical floor beam connecting into a floor girder. Um, a very common connection is to use uh, clip angles. And in that instance, you, uh, you're probably going to see just bolting. You know, have a beam framing into another beam. So you've got a clip angle, bolts through here, and bolts through here. So that there's really there's no welding. Um, but another common connection is to have a, uh, an end plate pre-welded onto that beam with holes in it, and then you just erect in, bolt, uh, and you're done. It's not as simple as saying, well, one's always cheaper than the other. It depends on steel prices, depends on labor rates. It, there's no yes or no answer. I'd love for there to be, but, but there isn't. So it's just project dependent, price dependent. You, you just need to be able to do both. All right, two questions. Uh, it doesn't matter. What's that? Well, that's going to be one of the issues in design. We're going to select the weld length based on limitations. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're more often than not assuming 45 degree angles. Rarely are you going to have like one weld leg that's, you know, way larger than the other. In fact, I don't think I've ever encountered one in a, in a design capacity. It's a, we've always assumed 45, 45, 90 so that they're the same size. It's a good question. And, and it is possible to deposit it that way, but... Not, no. So I know the engineering process for this is probably not what you're talking about, but maybe some mechanics that don't understand personally about the uh, construction industry. <laughs> so the, so for those laid out bricks, what do you need to hit to get the perfect length of the bricks? Well, what would you say is the average for the it's, I'm trying to come up with a, a simple answer to your question because it's not, it's not, I get what you're saying and it's not, it's not a simple uh, question to address. What I'll say is this, um, there, there are hundreds of ways to do very basic connections in a building, okay? You can use clip angles and never use a weld at all. You can have, just as an example, or you can have plates pre-welded onto the end of a, a beam and then when you bring it into the field, just set it in, bolt, bolt, and you're done. Which one you use, I mean, it, yes, it is a function of labor prices and steel prices and, and, and all of that, but it's also a function just generally of your fabricator. I mean, if your fabricator has their, their automation and their process set up to do welding a lot easier than another fabricator, then they're probably going to do a little bit more welding. The fabricator over here might be doing a little bit more bolting. It, there isn't really a, uh, uh, a simple answer. I mean... It's project dependent. There are some connections, I would say, where you can't get around. I mean, you got to have some welds. Like if you're doing a, a, a flange to web connection on a plate girder, that's a weld. That, that there's no ifs ands or buts about that. Um, does that kind of make sense? In a in a building. Oh, the client doesn't care if the building's made out of steel, concrete, popsicle sticks. They don't care. <laughs> no, I'm not serious. They, they don't care. I mean, they just want a building that, that stands up. The, all the architect cares about is that um, ingress, egress requirements are met. The clients, and bless you, all the codes are met for, for uh, building size and lighting and all that, that the, uh, the project meets the demands of the client, you know, in terms of square footage and, and all that, that it looks good. But by and large, um, as long as we're fitting within the architect's and the client's constraints, that's on us. We can do what we want. Um, does that kind of make sense? Yeah, the client, they don't care if the building's made out of steel or popsicle sticks. They don't care. I mean, think, if Geico uh, Insurance needs a new head, corporate headquarters and they contact uh, Lewis Engineering and Lewis Engineering's going to design the, the frame for them, do you think the gecko cares whether or not it's their bolts or welds? No, but he wants he does, the safety. The gecko does want to say 15% or more. But <laughs> 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 
That is a fantastic question. <laughs> I'd say you glue them. You glue them. Any other questions? No, they're u they're usually actually made of weaker steel. I mean, angles are typically A36. Um, they just might be thicker. So the big thing is just to make sure that you're match drilling so that the holes line up. And and as long as you've got block shear. Oh wow, it's gone down. Um, <laughs> all right, all right. Any other questions so we can get into some welded connections? No, I have to get, I have to go. <laughs> There's no uh, if ands or buts about that. All right. So let, let's look at this. So I want to determine the the strength that this uh, connection shown. So if you notice, are those welds longitudinal or are they transverse? They're going along the direction of the load. And if you play, if you ever design a connection and you have only transverse welds and I find out about it, I'm going to have you stick your hand up. I'm going to go, no, don't do that. Um, so, so longitudinal welds only, all right? <laughs> Goodness. Now, I've got a plate that's 10 inches by 3 quarters of an inch. Um, now, my weld, help, help me out. What's the size of this weld? It's a 5 sixteenths inch weld. How long are they? 15. That's what these two numbers mean. Remember, 5 sixteenths and 15. The triangle indicates that it is, in fact, a fillet weld. Okay? So as long as you understand that terminology, I'm good. True, but uh, you can also get around that by just pointing at both of them. Okay. Yeah. Um, and on long plate connections like that, I tend to do that more often than not. Sound good? All right. So I want to determine the strength of the connection, the design strength. So we've got A572 grade 50 steel for this tension member. We have E70 electrodes. So the electrode strength for these welds is 70 KSI. It's pretty simple. So let's take this one at a time. We've got the weld metal capacity and the base metal capacity. Um, it would help if I had my example problems open. No, there's not. You'll know one way or the other, I'll tell you. Does that sound like something I would do? Oh, your faith in me is staggering. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> this is recording. You realize that, right? Okay, all right, all right. Let's get back on track. All right, so... Here's how we're going to handle this. We're going to take each capacity one at a time. So we have weld metal capacity and we have base metal capacity. So let's start off with the weld metal capacity. I'm, I'm telling you, this is really simple. So weld metal capacity. Okay, first off, first off we have E70 electrodes, so our electrode strength is 70 KSI, okay? That's number one, all right? Number two, we have a weld that has a leg size of 5 sixteenths of an inch, okay? Um, and what I'm going to do for the length of the weld is I'm going to say it's 2 FE, oh, hold on, it's FEXX. Just electrode strength. Because think about it like this. We have F E seventy. So that's that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. <laughs> All right. What I'm gonna do for the weld length is I'm gonna say that the weld length is thirty inches because it's two times fifteen. Pretty basic, right? 
So here's the weld metal capacity. It, it's this simple. So phi Rn is phi. Now, what is phi? I'm just so curious. It is. It's on the. See, I've got those summary slides. So. Oh, goodness. Oh, wow. I mean, here it is. It's pretty straightforward. We have uh, 0.75 for fee. We have our nominal capacity of the weld is 0.6 times the electrode strength. Remember that whole uh, uh, von Mises, you know, 0.6 times the capacity because we're assuming that the weld is resisting the load in shear. And we have 0.707 A times the weld uh, length. Now that's it. So plug and chug. So 0.75. 0 0.6, 70 KSI, 0 0.707, 5 sixteenths, and 30 inches. And then we get P, so 208.8. I have a second on that? It's that simple. That's not that bad, is it? It's, it's, it's horrible. What? An exam on Friday, what? <laughs> you know, I'm just going to focus on base mental capacity. All right, base metal capacity. All right, so to do base metal capacity, we have shear yielding and we have shear fracture. But a couple things we need to, uh, to get out of the way right now. So we have a weld length of 30 inches. Now, what is the plate thickness? Because now we're looking at the plate. We're not looking at the weld. Three quarters. Three quarters. Okay. Now, let's start off with our areas. Okay, so we have gross area and net area. So let's start off with the gross area. So gross area in shear. Okay. Now gross area in shear, when we did block shear, I mean, how did we figure that out? It was the length in shear times the, the thickness. Well, since the length of the weld is 30 inches and the thickness is 3 quarters, the gross area in shear is... 30 times 3 quarters. But before I start doing anything, let's also look at the net area. In general, how do you compute net area? You take the gross area and you subtract the area loss due to the presence of bolts. There's no bolts. So gross area equals the net area. So therefore, gross area in shear equals the net area in shear, which is, oh, that, that made no sense. L, W, T. So 30 inches, 3 quarters, which is 22.5 square inches. Not hold on, hold on, hold on. You're you're you're, te you're testing my 3D art skills, but let me try something. Let me try something. All right. No, 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 no. No, you're you're making a reasonable point. Let, let me try. Okay. I'll, give me give me a chance. All right. So don't don't draw anything out because I gotta fix a couple things. All right. So. So we've got this and this, all right? Now the first thing that I propose that we do is we cope 
that that off a little bit so it's going to be kind of like this. Uh, this is not turning out the way exactly the way I wanted it, but yeah, you know, something like that, right? That's about the best you're going to get. Now, now hold, on, hold on, let me finish. Let me finish. Now, you're going to have a plate right here and a plate right here, and you might have, you know, bolts right there that are bolted into whatever it's being attached to. What I'm saying is that plate might be affixed to that web with welds there and there. <laughs> it's a happy little weld. <laughs> Okay. Now, in order to calculate, <laughs> in order to calculate base metal capacity, there's something else that we're going to need for the base metal. You tell me. Or two other properties we're going to need. There we go. F Y and F U. So, what is the grade for this plate? What is it? A572 grade 50. And for A572 grade 50, what's the F Y and the F U value? There we go. Is everybody able to find that? And then that's because we have A572 grade 50, table 2-4. Sound good? So in order to appropriately uh, handle this connection, we're going to do shear yielding and we're going to do shear fraction. Now, to compute shear yielding, help me out, what's the fee value? One. So for shear yielding, our capacity is one times 0.6 FYAG, right? AGV. So, so VRN um, and maybe I'll put, I'll do this. VRN Y is 1, 0 0.6 FYAGV, which is 1 times 0 0.6 times 50 KSI times 22.5. Square inches. So that's now that's yielding. Now phi R N for fracture is now what's the fee for fracture? 0.75. So 0 0.75 0 0.6 0 F U A N V. So 0 0.75, 0 0.6, 65 KSI, and 22.5. So what do we get for the top one? 675.0. I got a second on that? And what do we get for the bottom one? So, on your homework, you were doing problems where you were getting, you know, like a load of 200 kips, and you were getting a bearing capacity of 500 kips. That's fine. Okay. All that means is, if I take this connection and yank on it, like in this instance, it's the same story. We've got a weld metal capacity of 208 kips, but we have a base metal capacity of you know, 675 or something. So if you yank on this connection, the first thing that's going to happen is the weld's going to fail. Okay? And th think about it. You have a three-quarter inch plate and you have a weld that's only five sixteenths of an inch. I mean, shouldn't be that surprising, right? Sound good? So the capacity of this connection is 208.8 .8 kips. So if you want... Um, 
for the connection. BRN is that. Now, one thing I do want to mention, if you go through and actually do the math for gross section yielding and net section fracture, I mean, you do still have a piece of steel that you're yanking on, you'll find that for this connection, gross section yielding is about 338 kips and net section fracture is only 318.1, so, or 318.1. So 337.5 and 318.1, this still governs, okay? There's no bolts. Well, okay, so a couple things. Number one, the net area equals the gross area, just like it does here, okay? The only thing that's worth some additional discussion is the shear lag factor. And if you turn to the shear lag table uh, and you look at the shear lag table and look at case four, key value, yes. Go to case four and you'll see what I mean. This is one we didn't do before because we really weren't interested in, in welds. <laughs> oh, it's bad. Yeah, so, so you would determine your shear lag factor as a function of the length of the weld versus the width of the plate. Whatever that ratio is it would determine what your U value is. But other than that, the, the only, that's the only difference. The net area equals the gross area because there's no loss in, in, uh, in area due to the presence of bolts. Does that sort of help answer your question? Well, I, I propose neither of those are going to happen first. What's going to happen first is this. Right here. Now, now, hold on. Um, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Depending upon the numbers and the grade of steel, you could have fracture at that connection before yielding out in the main body. Remember, it's not yielding and fracture in the same place. Okay? So that's possible. Um, I'd say that for welded connections, you're on to something that it's more likely but it's not always the case. Because of shear lag. Because remember, shear lag is accounting for the fact that not all of that area right there around the connection is effective in resisting the load because the stresses aren't uniform. You're, you're, you're probably still thinking, oh, well, the stresses are all uniform, so it's just since Fy is smaller than Fu, Fu or Fy is going to happen first. But it's not just the yield stresses, it's also the areas. You see what I mean? Does that make sense? Like if I have a, um, a really, really, if I have a normal piece of steel and I'm, you know, yanking on it, but I have a really, really high quality grade of steel and yanking on it, if they're the same size, well then the regular steel is going to fail first. But if I've got a really, really big piece of normal steel, and a really, really tiny piece of very, very high quality steel. Well, it's not so simple. You see what I mean? Does that, does that kind of help answer your question? Uh, no, I'd say no. I'd say it comes with just doing the math. Well, uh, well, knowing the material properties come, comes into practice. I, I'll, I, well, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would. There's, yeah, you're a absolutely right. More weld equals more capacity. 
are, it depends on however much you add. I mean, if you add another inch of weld, that's another inch of LW. That's simple. It can be, but conservatively, it's not. Um, the only time it, you actually ever uh, specifically handle weld orientation is if you have an eccentrically loaded connection, but that's a, a whole other animal. That, no, go ahead. Yeah, and, and that goes back to those curves that we were looking at earlier. Technically, transverse welds can hold up more load but they're less ductile. Typically what is done is we just, you know what, they're all resisting the load through shear and they're all behaving the same. You're going to get a conservative answer anyways. But the big point is don't use the transverse welds by themselves. I mean, transverse welds are fine if there's longitudinal welds also. Does that sound good? Anybody else? All right. I do want to look at something else real quick, um, and I want to look at the weld limits. Okay. So does everybody have this? I know that, that wasn't really uh, part of the example, but I think it's important. Um, okay, so weld limits. Okay, so we have a weld size that's what five sixteenths. So I want to check the minimum and maximum weld size. Let's take the minimum. How do I determine what is the minimum weld size? No, no, that's maximum. The, well, you, you need plate thickness either way, but my point is there's there's a formula for maximum. The minimum, there's the table. Yeah, yeah. So let's find that table. I'm making you all go through your notes. Oh, no. Well, yeah, but I want you to find it in manual, too. But I want you to be able to find it in the manual. <laughs> now, it's table J2.4. It's on 16.1 dash what? 111. All right. So we have a plate. What's the thickness of the plate? Three quarters. So over one half to three quarters, we have a minimum weld size of a quarter of an inch. Okay. Now, that's uh, our minimum weld size, so we'll put amen is quarter of an inch, and I got that from that. Now, A max, okay, A max is either the thickness or the thickness minus the sixteenth of an inch, depending upon whether our thickness is less than or greater to a quarter of an inch, which is much larger than that. So our A max is T minus the sixteenth of an inch. So that is three quarters minus one sixteenth. So three quarters is twelve sixteenths, so that's eleven sixteenths. And we have an A of 5 sixteenths. Sound good? Everybody all right with that? So our A is 5 sixteenths, so we are okay. Any questions? This isn't so bad, is it? It's pretty simple. Um, all right, if you understand that, does everybody have everything on the screen? Everybody good? Okay, well, if you understand that, then the design of a fillet weld is pretty simple. Um, when we design bolted connections, I mean, how did we go about it? We said we've got the capacity of a bolt, we got the load, divide, to get the number of volts. 
Well, for welds, it's you got the load, you get the capacity of one inch of weld, divide to determine the number of inches. That's it. It's really that simple. You can use the weld limitations to determine the appropriate weld size. When in doubt, you know, we want to get we want our weld size to be as big as possible as long as it doesn't go over five sixteenths. Okay. And now, if we're talking about a you know crazy connection where we've got to use a you know a three quarter inch weld, well then use a three quarter inch weld. But most typical connections uh, in 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 uh, straightforward structures, you're going to want to keep it. Five sixteenths. Um, you might have to go under that if your limits don't allow you to get a, a if you have a maximum weld size of let's say a quarter of an inch. Um, but when in doubt, go to five sixteenths. All right. Determine the capacity of one inch of weld. Divide to get the total number of inches. That's it. So we're going to do a very similar example. Only in this instance, we are in design mode. So now we've got yeah. No, no, that's not defined by code. That's one of the. That's just. Yeah, that's just about the largest weld you can get in a single pass. Now, if the numbers don't work out right, and you've got you do a design and you've got a weld that's 80 inches long, you know, well, use multiple passes to get it short. Yeah. Right. Sound good? All right. So using E70 electrodes, let's design a fillet weld to resist a service dead load of 15 and a service live load of 40 kips. I guess I should put that the live load's already reduced, but I mean, I think we pretty well um, recognize that unless it says otherwise, you know, the live loads are reduced. We've got a similar grade of steel, and we assume that the capacity of the gusset plate is adequate. In other words, when we check our, um, when we check our uh, 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 weld, our base metal capacity, we can just worry about this one. We don't have to worry about that. Sound good? All right. This is what we're going to do. Next time, I, I, I want to get through this example, um, and I want to get, I, I want to try and get through this one pretty expeditiously because our last um, weld arrangement uh, example is looking at a balanced weld. And I do want to at least introduce what that concept means. So, if you look at the configuration, like let's put it like this. Here's example 13. We're going to do it real quick, and we're going to get this answer. Okay. And I'll show you how we get that. Uh, you know, uh, next time. But let's take a look at this. This is a rectangular plate, okay? It's just a, just a plate. And we're going to determine that we need about 12 inches of weld, okay? So just based on common sense, does it make sense? If you were laying out this connection, put six inches of weld up here, six inches of weld down here. Sound simple, right? Okay? Now that's easy for a plate, okay? My question is, what if it's an angle? Okay, if it's an angle, you might not want to do that. Okay, and the reason why is because the centroid for an angle is offset. The centroid of an angle is actually closer to this side than it is to this side. So we're also going to do a welded connection design problem like this, and what we're going to find is we're probably going to have a connection that winds up something like this. We're going to have, you know, like a lot of weld down here. But we might only have something like that up there, okay? And the reason why is because the centroid for an angle is closer to this end than it is to that end. So you put more weld here to resist that load than you do here. It's kind of like beam reactions. I mean, imagine if you had a beam right here and the load was all the way over here. Well, this reaction is going to be larger than that one, right? So you need more weld over here than you do over there literally the same idea, okay? And th that concept is called a balanced connection. Right. Yes? So would it be ideal to put a transverse weld directly at the centroid? That's a good question. You can put a weld right here and, and account for that during your equilibrium, uh, and we're actually going to do that for, for this example. We're going we're gonna to put a transverse weld. Like this. It's actually a, a little more difficult to do a transverse weld. Like once you understand how to do that, you can do one without a transverse weld by just setting that capacity equal to zero. Does that make sense? 
All right. Next time, let's try, all right, hold on. Next time, let's try to power through these weld examples because I want you all to be prepared for your homework. I mean, I'm giving you your homework on Friday, so I, I want you all to be ready for it. And then we begin, after welds, the topics in this class are going to take a complete 180 because up until now, we've been talking about fracture and yielding and things like that. Well, with columns and beams, we have buckling to talk about, and it's a completely different story. So um, things change after welds. I just want to give you a heads up. Are welds going to be on the buckling? Yes. No. That's the final. All right. Anything else? All right. If you're not in concrete, I'll see you. If so, I'll see you in a few minutes.